Welcome to Uncommon Sense, where we do our best to make it common again. I'm your host, Adrian Alquist. Today I'm joined by Sean Pilcher, who is a relic expert and a Latinist. He is one of the few people in the United States that can actually verify relics. And we're going to get into what that means. Um, and we're going to talk about what relics are, for those who don't know. Uh, but how are you, Sean? I'm just happy to be here, Adrian. <laughs> nice. We're also good friends. Uh, Brother Titus, who I've interviewed on the podcast, uh, basically set us up. He's like, hey, go to dinner. And he decides to leave back to his abbey. So he wasn't even there to introduce us. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But no, uh, Sean is very, very smart. He knows every language, I'm pretty sure, just every single one. Uh, <laughs> doesn't like to brag about it. But we'll, we'll talk about that too. But first, Sean, what are relics? So um, relics are uh, objects, uh, either pieces of saints or objects associated with those people. So uh, bones or hair of a saint, um, part of their flesh, or things that they owned, a piece of their rosary or a page from their breviary, um, picture that they had, part of their sweater, things like that. Gotcha, yeah. And we'll go over some of Chesterton's relics, even though they're not officially relics because Chesterton's not a saint yet. Right. But they would be relics once he is canonized. Um, and before we continue, I should probably mention the conference again. Have I ever mentioned this? Uh, I have. <laughs> but everyone go to chesterton.org slash conference. And um, I have new information. The conference, if you're attending virtually, of course, we want you to attend in person. But if you are if you can't come, uh, you can also do the conference virtually. And it's free for members. So if you're a member uh, of the society, it'll be free for you. Um, becoming a member is literally, it's just $5 a month, but, and you have access to a lot of other materials. Uh, but yeah, you can, you can then join the conference virtually for free. Uh, okay. Yes. So back to relics. Um, what, what, why do Catholics venerate relics? Actually, what does that even mean? What does it mean to venerate a relic? Yeah. So to venerate, uh, just as a Latin word, it means to give honor to, and, um, uh, relics can be a little creepy to our kind of modern, 21st century American sensibilities. Um, but there's something that's really nitty gritty about the Catholic faith, um, something physical, something kind of tangible. And it's a way to help us connect to people are, who are in heaven. So um, we might have a family heirloom or um, something passed down, uh, you know, object that belonged to our grandparents. Uh, we might have letters that were written during the war back home. Um, we might have a, a piece of our grandmother's hair that she kept in a locket. Um, you know, these are things that kind of as um, 21st century people give us a little pause, but we can see how having a tangible reminder of something is important. And you can go to a museum and see Elvis's guitar, or you can see the first jersey that Babe Ruth wore. You can see important kind of physical reminders. And so there are ways of kind of... Um, having the saints near us in a way uh because the body is not just the body is not just part of a person but it is um really what makes us um, body and soul together um so the the soul of the person's in heaven but there's something there's some yeah, way the, there's a hypostatic union of body and soul right Isn't sure that right yeah and so there there's a way in which the relic, especially if it's a piece of the person or something that belonged to the person, there's a way in which mm, that still kind of participates in the economy of grace. Gotcha. Yeah. So. I like how you bring it down to earth because uh, it is kind of a foreign idea, especially even to, to Protestants. They don't, they don't really engage with the idea of saints a lot, sure. um, but, but they, but I have a lot of family members who are Protestants who are Christians uh, and they are very nostalgic. So they do have a lot of memorabilia of of other family members and friends. And so uh, and so that's a good a example where we that we still honor them that way. Mm -hmm. And that's just how what we do with, with saints. Yeah, that's right. And there's precedent in scripture. You have the mantle of Elijah. You have the things kept in the Ark of the Covenant, the shoot that blossomed. You have the tablets. Um, and then, you know, in the New Testament, um, People touch our Lord's robe to be to be cured. Um, they reach out for Saints Peter and Paul. Um, Saint Peter, his shadow even heals um, someone. So it's it's not entirely a new thing that we made up, like in the Counter Reformation or something. There's precedent mm -hmm. even until um, even back to the earliest centuries of the Church. People preserving the bones of the martyrs and people risking their lives to go recover what were considered precious gems, right, to the early Church. So cool. it, that's great. They're important yeah. things for important kind of pieces of heritage for us Catholics. 
Awesome. So there are different types of relics, sure, right? Sure, yeah. Uh, we, we don't regard uh, a belonging that they had on the same level as a part of their body, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. So can you go into the different classes of relics? Sure. So relics are often spoken of in, in as you say, kind of three classes. And um, a first class relic is kind of a, the relic in a strict sense. It's what you would find in the altar stone of a church. It's what you would see kind of for veneration of the faithful. Um, and this is a piece of the saint. So if there are saints that happened long ago or who lived long ago, more common is a bone because that's the kind of thing that lasts longer. Um, and you can go to Europe and see, you know, skulls and things like this. <laughs> Very fun. We don't have any of those yet. But um, then uh, so uh, bone or hair or flesh, something like that. And a second class would be something that belonged to the saint or something that uh, some people say that um, something that a saint had contact with when they were alive. So, you know, a piece of a book of theirs or a piece of their clothing or rosary beads, things like that. And then a third class is kind of more of a devotional practice among the faithful. It's a um, piece of cloth or some people will touch their rosary or their scapular to these first or second class relics, which are kind of more relics, strictly speaking. But the third class is a way of people kind of remembering or kind of blessing an object with a relic of a saint. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, it's important to note that you can't sell relics yeah. at least first and second yes Can you absolutely sell no third? anything that anything with the word relic is yeah is, okay it's expressly canon law forbids the sale mm. of relics it's called simony yeah right yeah. yeah yeah so you know the man approaches and he says what you know what, what how much money can i give you to go to heaven right yeah you no. can't sorry so <laughs> yeah. you can't pay for sacraments and you can't pay for relics and but you can buy a relic uh, if you are protecting it from being bought by someone who might be uh, ha have a bad intention with it. So if oh, there's someone sure. selling it, uh, you can buy it to protect it, not not for the purpose of selling it again, but to give it maybe to a church. Or I, I, there are there's specific rules about that, but that's one case where there's a there's kind of a uh, clarifier right there. Comment. Sure. Yeah. So there's a there's the prohibition is is really on the sale of relics. Yeah. Um, and sometimes people don't either they're not aware of what they have or they um, don't care, you know, that the sale of holy things is is irreverent and forbidden. So th there's an, an instance where I was in a like an antique shop, for example, and um, I saw a, a relic in a case, which was a rather nice kind of gold case. And um, so the, the price was listed there, a couple hundred dollars. And, and so, you know, I talked to the man and kind of Tried to see if he knew what he had, and he, he did. But um, as you might imagine, uh, Catholics telling non-Catholics what kind of rules we have for them is not always going to be the best way to <laughs> right. resolve a situation like this. So I just, you know, talked to him about what he thought the value of the case would be. Because you're allowed to, you know, if someone's preparing a relic or if the case is, is a something that's valuable, you're allowed to pay for that within reason. But you would want to make sure that the price wasn't suspiciously high. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, I, we, we made a kind of arrangement and I left my name and said, you know, if anything else comes up like this, uh, you, would you please contact me first before you put it in a store and, and, you know, maybe we can work something out and we can give it to a church or something. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yep. And people get them from eBay, things like that. Yeah. You have to be very careful because most of the relics on eBay are fake. Um, and if yeah. you're bidding, if you're bidding on them, probably you're bidding against other good Catholics who want to get them off the internet. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. So it's not that's, something I would. That's know, confusing. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Yes. It but is. so on that note, you verify relics. Uh, you you kind of look at if they're fake or not, right? Sure. That, sure. Yeah. So what what methods do you have for determining that? Because I imagine that would be kind of hard sometimes. Yeah. Right. So um, people I think are rightly suspicious of relics and um. Certainly, at certain periods in the church, there have been kind of a uh, you know abuse of relics, but uh, we all know that misuse does not negate the proper use, uh, the proper place of relics. In, yeah, you in don't Christian throw life. the baby out with the bathwater. Exactly. And so um, even though there were at times multiple churches in Europe who had the head of John the Baptist, um, <laughs> we do our best to um, kind of make sure, as far as one can know, uh, that a relic is authentic. Um, you want to look at things like uh, the case it's in, um, relics have seals and paperwork. Uh, all of these things can be forged, but what you do is you kind of build a case like you would in a court or something. You build a case and you present evidence and you 
um, look at the facts. And if you know some Latin and you know some history and you know a little bit about the relic, then you can make a, an educated guess like any other kind of um, historian or someone in a museum would make with any other kind of artifact. And that's what we do. A good indicator if, if it's real is uh, if it starts having some miraculous uh, elements to it. <laughs> sure, <laughs> there, are, there are stories, especially medieval stories of... Um, you know, monks doing things like throwing throwing the uh, relic in an incense thurible to see if it would burn, or <laughs> healing sick people. Um, yeah. But there are stories you uh, I know um, or have met a couple of exorcist priests who will talk about bringing a, a relic to an exorcism, and they don't even bring it out. But um, the person who's possessed will will wince and be in pain, and um, the you know the demon will say, "You have a relic here," uh, and the demon will know. Or uh, there's a trick where um, they would take the the relic out of the case and just, you know, leave the relic aside and bring the case and the person would laugh, you know, because the relic wasn't there. But then he would bring the relic without the case and the person would be even more disturbed, right? Because you could have the relic near the person. So yeah. it's, it's a very interesting thing. Yeah. A good day when you can trick a demon into verifying a relic for you, right? <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> but so how did I've you... never done that. Yeah, well, done, yeah. <laughs> that's probably good. Um, so how did you become interested in relics and verifying them in the first place? Because that yeah. seems pretty niche. As, I mean, I, we know it's pretty niche. So. It is. It's eclectic. It's eclectic. And I um, uh, do my best to be helpful to... Um, you know, priests and religious communities and churches that have relics without uh, passing any kind of uh, judgment on the thing they have or, um, you know, doing my best to provide the information I have. But um, but I don't have like a business that I run on it or anything <laughs> like that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just to, to um, kind of spread the, the knowledge about and the respect for relics. Because um, I, as I said, they're, they're an ancient um, tradition in the church. And they have a, you know, um, they're in altars of altars of churches. Every church, or every altar, when it's consecrated, has the the relics usually of three martyrs placed in what's called an altar stone, in the church. And uh, growing up as a as a boy, I uh, was receiving a tour from of the church from our parish priest, and you know wanted to know like wh whose relics are in there, you know, and he he didn't know, and most people don't. And uh, I said, well, wh well, why don't we? You know, what's the problem? <laughs> and so. Um, you know, you throw a little Latin and a little history in there, and um, all of a sudden you have kind of an interest in a, yes, as you say, rather niche thing. But um, that's been great. that's beautiful, yeah. Uh, so you actually brought some relics with you, thankfully. Yes, yes, uh, I did. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see these uh, these cases here. Mm -hmm. You can hold them up to the camera. Sure, yeah. So a uh, relic comes normally in a teca, which is their a theca. Some people say in English is just kind of this little kind of round case if you're listening here, yeah, hold, hold it's, it. it's a it's a round sort of thing here uh and then they can also be placed in what are called reliquaries which is just a kind of fancy case for a relic here we uh this is a uh, saint john henry newman here a piece of his vestments that would be one of these kind of second class relics and then if they're bigger or more obscure you got to get different kind of cases for them so here's a piece of saint florian who's a martyr patron saint of firefighters and other kind of first responder people here's a larger relic so it comes in a larger case but um the important thing is not the the glitzy case but it's the you know it's what's inside yeah they it, say. that's a way of honoring or venerating the that's the right relic. yeah we use precious things we use precious materials to adorn precious things yeah so, so we, the, we the big case right here if you hold that one up yes that's, right that's uh part of this office a belonging yes, to ours yes uh for now it, at least <laughs> for now i know yeah so this is hair from gk chesterton that's right and that's pretty cool. So this would be a first class relic if yes. he was a saint. Yes, someday. Yeah, relics um, are, are not distributed until a cause is open um, uh, officially. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, at that point, then they're kind of distributed uh, for for the faithful and their veneration and asking for his intercession. And yeah. So this would be one of those first class relics. And you have uh, something yes, right. also of great interest, which would be a yes. Chesterton relic. If you're not on YouTube, I feel sorry. For you guys, you should be. <laughs> you can you can always go on YouTube and, and yes. watch this. But yes, uh, but here is a second class relic. It would be of Chesterton's. This and I, I think uh, my dad has shown this before. But this is Chesterton's walking stick, and it's got a cool eagle on top. Or um, yeah, and he mostly used this to point to things. This would probably not withstand his weight, his full weight. If he was using it as a walking stick, maybe. Uh, <laughs> but no, this this is what he he really liked to point to stuff uh, and. Yeah. So there you go. Yes. Very important. Uh, one day relic. And I'll be uh, using my Swiss army knife to shave pieces of that off before I leave. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right. So 
that and then we also have some some books that he wrote in in the office somewhere. sure yeah things with um, his signature letters um little drawings he made for people these are all uh, especially with more recent saints all things that we treasure um you know saints in the last century we have correspondence and we have clothing they had and other things so there are plenty of of relics like that or would be relics for yeah for the man himself um yeah you, this isn't directly related to actually no this is related to relics and uh what i'm going to talk about with you next with which is languages uh can you tell the story about the translator in the vatican oh good the kind of de- good <laughs> the- so so the yeah the the man um uh, kind of semi-famous a latinist i'm a, just a lowly latin teacher myself but um, a man whom I admire very much, who who just died last Christmas, God rest him, uh, Father Reginald Foster, who was a kind of bigwig Vatican Latinist. And um, anyway, by a kind of happy circumstance, I uh, was able to uh, come into possession of his Latin Bible. So I kind of joke around that that could be like a relic someday of him, you know, right. if he ever gets canonized. <laughs> he was kind of a hothead, so we'll see. But who knows? Um, I mean, he did a lot of great work, right? That's so, right. So, yeah. I mean, he he trans. How, how much did he translate? Well, he worked for um, I think four popes. Um, and wow, any kind of you know encyclical or anything that came out of the Vatican. Um, he, he joked around that he was he was telling Saint John Paul II once, who wanted to write a, an encyclical on the relationship between uh, the intellect. And on Revelation, he said, oh, you, you got to name it uh, De Relatione Inter uh, Intellectu uh, Revelatione Que. And John Paul II said, no, we have to name it Fides et Ratio. <laughs> and he said, ah, oh, that'll never catch on. Well, you know, <laughs> anyway, so you can go to your local Catholic bookstore and buy Fides et Ratio. Yeah. Which was translated into Latin by none other than Reginald Foster. So. That's awesome. Yeah. So mm-hmm. so you have his his book that he used to translate, right? So his I, I have his I have his Vulgate Bible, which um I use with my students. I, I teach school and um so we read out of the Vulgate and he so he would read to his students out of the Bible and so I have it on sitting on my desk at work and I don't yeah, know if you wanted school. to make that public, but, but no, it's good, a great no, story. Uh, yeah. don't, I won't say the name of the school. Don't steal it. But, <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, it's a real treasure. And um, it, it just goes to show that we all have things like this. Um, it might not be a piece of someone's bones, but we all as humans have things that we like or that we are near to us, not because of inherent value they have, but because of the connections they give us to people. Um, you think about like if your house is burning down, what's the thing you bring with you? Well, it might be your expensive uh, something. Cash. You know. It, it <laughs> might be your cash, cash but it, it probably isn't. It's probably yeah. uh, the quilt from your grandma or the letters that somebody wrote or the, you know, maybe yeah. it's not a Rolex. Maybe it's the watch that your dad gave you when you graduated college. I mean, this is how human beings are. And so the church in her wisdom knows what we need and knows what will profit us for the spiritual life. And, and why would this, if, if grace builds on nature, why would the spiritual be any kind of exception to this natural need as human beings? Yeah, that was very well said. Uh, so uh, last topic is the fact that you are a linguist as well. Well, amateur. <laughs> well, yeah. But I, I imagine knowing Latin really helps with the verification. I mean, just there's a lot of uh, relics that are tied to to, to, to Latin and sure, yeah, and, all of the documentation and yeah. uh, notes that uh, relic prepares and things that kept were all in Latin. This was the language uh, that was used, um, you know, until the latter half of the last century to to do anything related to relics. So, if you don't know Latin, you're going to have trouble. And then the Latin used is kind of technical, um, with various ways of writing things and abbreviations, and often a kind of old, florid. European way of writing, and so yeah, it's it's a tremendous help to have Latin. Yeah, who said Latin wasn't practical? That's a lesson for you kids out there. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yes, learn your declensions, folks. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, what got you interested in these languages? Well, I mean, it might be a similar story to how sure. you got into well, relics, but yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I um uh started using using Latin at church uh, at a, at a pretty young age, and and fell in love with the beauty of it. Um. It didn't have any kind of uh, political or really academic underpinning. It was pretty naive, really, and I just thought it was pretty and kind of liked the challenge and liked um, the uniqueness of it. And 
um, began to study other languages and, and realized I had kind of a knack for it. So I'm still studying them and I mm-hmm. don't plan on quitting anytime soon. And for those who don't know, Latin really helps learning the Romance languages That's right. because mm-hmm. they're based off of it. They, they came out of Latin to a certain extent. What are the five Romance languages again? Uh, well, there are more than five, Adrian, but... The, I thought the, there were only five. Well, there are there are some kind of minority languages that, you know... Okay, okay. Of, of <laughs> people who probably don't... Li- if, you're, if, you're, if you're a minority... Uh, romance language speaker and you're listening please forgive us but, uh, Spanish <laughs> okay, what are, what are the and French ones? and Italian and Portuguese and the one that everyone always forgets about is Romanian Romanian, Romanian uh, which has a kind of Slavic uh, flavor to it but then there are ones like uh, Catalan which is spoken you know in northern Spain and southern France Andorra there are things like Occitan um, Provençal, you know, with the, the troubadours wrote in. These are other kind of Latinate languages. But if um, Latin is a parent, then these languages are kind of children of that. Gotcha. Cool. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, if you if you know the, the the mother language, then why wouldn't you, you know, have a facility with the others? Would you be able to have a conversation in all those languages with someone? Uh, to a varying degree. I think it would depend on their interest in waiting for me, finding the word, or... <laughs> You know what? What else they had to do that afternoon? Uh, now, what? I, I mean, I know that that a lot of Italian speakers can speak Spanish or at least understand Spanish, sure, and sure. vice versa. Is that the case with like Romanian or not so much? Uh, Romanian is uh, the weird one. It, Romanian is a little bit the oddball because of that Slavic kind of. Um, you know, it's like a little spice kind of, <laughs> yeah. uh, and so it's it's affected a way the way that some of the grammar works. Um, it preserves a couple of features from Latin that are kind of more difficult for other speakers. So they can understand us by and large, but we would have we would have a little more of a learning curve understanding Romanian. Yeah, okay. Uh-huh. Uh, it must be cool to learn about the other people's cultures from the language perspective because Certainly. a language affects culture and uh, and just kind of the different ideas that are in different languages that aren't in, let's say, English or What's, or, or even vice versa. I mean, we have words that aren't, that are kind of like bunched up in other languages. Yeah, um, it's true that there isn't always a, a one-for-one equivalent. And there's a kind of richness in, in speaking one's own language. And then in reading like all the great literature of the world uh, without translation which yeah. is cool. Which I can't, I mean, I can't read all the great literature of the world. But For a while, I started the podcast by saying... You know, I'm your host, Adrian Alquist, and today I'm joined with Dale Alquist, uh, or I'm joined with Nancy Brown. And, yes, yes. And that um, you did it, mention that our monk friend set us up, but we're not being joined in that way. <laughs> exactly. Don't worry. Yes. yes. No. No. But but in Latin, it would be the same word, right? It'd be ah, right? By, with, uh, or from. Well, or, okay. Yeah. Maybe. I might uh, be or, simplifying it too much. Or cum or coram or. Um, I don't know if you ever looked this up, but did Chesterton uh, speak any other languages? Well, you know, he was an educated man, but he was also English. So, um, I have to tread lightly here, but, uh, the English, I guess, especially Chesterton are famous for their kind of, uh, uh, I once asked an English friend of mine, um, how many languages do you speak? And he said, English loudly. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> Chesterton was, was an educated man, certainly had great facility with French and, and his friend Belloc read German, I think pretty well, um, would have Latin, would have been educated in Greek. A lot of these are, are questions of whether he kept them up or not. But he was, you know, he was a literary man, and he kept a, a you know, journalistic correspondence. And so the languages of Europe, I think, would have been ready at hand. And and his own um, facility with English shows certainly a great amount of reading uh, authors from other places. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, knowing Latin helps with English. I didn't mention that. Like Absolutely. That, that so many words derived from Latin. It's Absolutely. Just, you can get it. Yeah. But yeah. That's that's basically all I had. Did you um, do I have anything else you wanted to say about relics or or languages? Uh, well, no. Learn a language if you haven't. I mean, you've learned English, assumedly, if you're listening. Oh, I guess this is another question I had. Was which is, um, yeah, a lot of a lot of the conception sometimes is that oh, I'm an adult now, I can't learn a language. You have to be a kid or you know whatever. So how well, how would you respond to that? Well, it's true that it might be harder uh, because we're so proud, and this might be something that Chesterton could teach us: is we have to become like little babes. You know, we have to become uh, like children. That doesn't mean we have to become childish, although some of us are. But uh, you have to put in some work that you wouldn't if you were a kid. You are. Um, used to kind of being good at things as an adult and you're kind of set in your ways. So it's like learning the piano or learning a new sport or 
Yeah, it's it's, it's about being ma- malleable. malleable. Yeah, right. You have to be open to it. You have to be yeah. humble. You have to learn to make mistakes. And you just have to put in a lot of time. If you are going to go uh, and do something once a week, it's going to take you years. Yeah, uh, but that, that's you... actually part of the virtue of being open-minded. I know that's kind of a controversial word in some circles, but but actually, you, it's not about about you know necessarily adopting a new philosophy that's right. usually where the it gets a bad rap it's but it's actually about being able to see it from their perspective sure you might, might actually be able to learn not only a new you know thing about what you believe but mm. but actually a new skill that's actually something that is closely tied together someone who's open-minded can easily learn new skills and that's that's something that is hard for for people who are kind of shut in their ways. So that's, I, I think that is an important note. At that's least. right. Yeah. yeah. There's a kind of virtue of docility, mm-hmm. uh, being able to be taught that, um, children have, uh, because they're not as jaded and, uh, worried about what they look like, you know? Um, and it's something that they always teach me, you know, they're open to learn and kind of pick things up in a way that we have to, we have to, we have to learn how to learn again, you yeah, know, and exactly. they already know. So, was so, what we try to do at Chesterton. That's right. <laughs> Pl- plug right there. Shameless plug. Yes, that's right. Yes. But we are the, the society. Send, your, send your children to a Chesterton school. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Sean, for coming on and teaching us about this. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, that that was really cool. And uh, and make sure everyone, again, sign up for the conference. Yes. Yes. But uh, let, let us know if you have any questions. I, I don't usually say this. Let us know. Put in, in YouTube comments any questions. Or you can actually email us. Um, the best, I think, email us at podcast at gesturgen.org and, um, and we'll try to, to get to you. But until next time, help us to make uncommon sense more common. <laughs> <laughs>